This morning we are continuing our journey down what is called the Romans Road. The Romans Road is a selection of verses from the book of Romans which provide us as believers with a kind of a broad overview of the gospel. And it also is a helpful tool because these verses are rather short but yet carry a lot of weight to them, and so they're easily memorizable, and so as we share our faith with our friends, neighbors, co-workers, and family, these verses can be used by the Holy Spirit as He brings them to mind to share the truths from God's Word of what God has done for them. We began that a number of weeks ago with the first stop along the Romans road, and what is that? Romans 3... 23. And what is that verse? For all of the That's right. Let's say it again. Just for us to say this together. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A number of weeks ago, as we looked at this verse, we said that the Scriptures teach that all mankind have exchanged the glory of God for a lie. They have, uh, instead of worshiping the Creator, they have worshiped the creature. And in, do, in doing so, they no longer honor God or give thanks to Him. God gives them over to a darkened mind. They no longer fear the Lord. Then last week, we went on our next stop on the journey. So you have Romans 3.23. The next verse is what? Romans 6.23. And that verse is, for the wages of sin, but the gift of in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's say that again together. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we looked at this verse together, we recognize that sin is not just something we do. Of course, it is. But sin is also here a personified power whom we present ourselves before in order to serve sin. And in serving sin, sin promises us life, but doles out his wage, and his wage is paid to us in death. This week, we'll take our next stop on our journey. So we've gone from Romans 3 to Romans 6, and now we're going to go back a chapter to Romans chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 8. So I'll put this on our screen, and let's read this together as well. Romans 5, 8, together. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Turn to your neighbor and say, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And while the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are overwhelmed that while we were still sinners, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. We pray that we would leave today better understanding the weight of that sentence, that we would not simply understand it, but that would travel down from our head to our hearts, and we would cling to it, and it would change us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here in Romans 5, is the first time the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans begins to unpack the love of God. He's been talking about the gospel, the grace of God, the judgment of God, the justice of God, but here he begins to unpack the love of God. And being made in God's image, we are made to desire love, to receive love, and to give love. And we all love a good love story. My favorite, or one of my favorite love stories, is called The Princess Bride. 
Maybe you've seen that before. It's the story of a young man named Wesley and his beloved buttercup. And the story is Wesley in pursuit of his beloved buttercup, and they go on adventures together until, of course, they end up happily ever after. At one point in that story, Wesley kind of experiences a fatal wound. He seems to be dead, and so his friends, Inigo Montoya and others, they bring him to the house of a man named Miracle Max. Miracle Max, you remember, is played by Billy Crystal. And uh, they bring him because they think that maybe Miracle Max can do something for Wesley. Maybe they can bring him back to life. Maybe he can. And uh, so Miracle Max turns to Aniga Montoya and he says, well, why do you want me to bring him back? Why, why do you want him? You know, what, what's he owe you money or something? And uh, they go back and forth. He says, well, you let me just ask him. And, and he says, well, how can you ask him? He's dead. He says, your friend's not dead. He's only mostly dead. He's not all dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. And he says, well, because it's, well, because when somebody's all dead, there's only one thing left to do. And Inigo Montoya says, what's that? Well, if they're all dead, the only thing left to do is to go through their clothes and look for loose change. <laughs> but your friend is not all dead. He's mostly dead. And so he takes these bellows, right, and he blows air into the lungs of Wesley. And then he looks down at Wesley in this real thick Brooklyn accent, which I can't really do. He goes, hey, hello down there. What's so important? What do you got that's worth living for? And then he puts his hands on Wesley's chest and he presses down so the air will expel out his vocal cords as Wesley vocalizes the words, true love. And Aniga Montoya says, look, see, true love. There's nothing more honorable than true love. And Miracle Max says, true love is the greatest thing in the world. Except for an MLT, a mutton, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, she says. <laughs> but what we're going to be talking about today is the greatest love story ever told. A love story that all other love stories pale in comparison to. And that is the love story of the gospel. And to recognize that the love story of the gospel and the love of God is radical. No other love story compares to this one at all. And what I hope we can do today is leave with a greater sense and appreciation of just how radical the love of God is, and what He has done for us. And to begin to unpack just how radical the love of God is, we need to start by looking at the object of God's love. And the object of God's love is you and me and to see that that is a radical object of love. If you take, for example, the love that's put forth in The Princess Bride, it's a love that makes a lot of sense. Buttercup is a lovely woman. Buttercup is beautiful. Buttercup is not only beautiful on the outside, she has a beautiful personality. She's, if, you, if you see her, in she's a beautiful person. It makes sense that Wesley would find Buttercup be the proper object of his love and affection. The radical nature of God has to do with this fact. You aren't. <laughs> in Romans chapter 5, before we get to verse 8, you know, and when he says God's love is demonstrated in this, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. We have verses 6 and 7 that lead up to that. And Paul is comparing and contrasting a human love with a divine love. And there he begins by saying this, you see, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. 
You know, there might be an, an object of some, someone's affection that's so lovely, so great, so righteous that maybe, maybe somebody might die for them. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Unless we begin to understand the full weight of that phrase, while we were still sinners, we will not understand the gospel and we will not understand grace. The full weight while we were still sinners. If we went out into the society today, in our culture here, and you ask the average person, do you think people are basically good or people are basically bad? What answer do you think you would get? People are basically good or bad? Basically good. That's the general, I'm not saying every single person, but the general answer from much of our society is that people are basically good. I, there was a news report just a few years old, and it, was, it, it really struck me because the, the, the headline of this article said, breaking news, breaking news report. And here's the breaking news. People are inherently good and nonviolent. Breaking news. And the substance of the article went on to say this. When we hear about bad things, do we hear about some bad things? We hear sometimes some bad things. Here's what you should do. If you hear about anything bad, here's what you got to do. Remind yourselves as a mantra over and over again, people are basically good, people are basically good, people are basically good. We are hardwired, he says, for goodness. And we start from a place of moral purity. Not moral neutrality, moral purity. I don't know if you ever had kids, but <laughs> moral purity. That's our culture today. When I'm sharing the gospel here in Livingston County, here's something that I commonly find. It's different than other places. So if I'm in New York and other places when I live there, the, the conversations are different because different milieus, different cultures are slightly different. When I'm sharing the gospel here in Livingston County, in general, you generally get from people that there is a God. It's not that there aren't going to be exceptions to that, but in Livingston County, generally, people generally accept there is a creator, there is a God. They just don't see any need for him because they don't understand this phrase, while we were yet sinners. They think they're all basically good. Why do I need a savior if I'm basically good? Why do I need a doctor if I don't perceive I have any symptoms? It's exactly what Jesus told the Pharisees. I did not come, he says, I did not come for those who are well. And the problem is we have a culture around us who all think that they are well. And Jesus says, I did not come for them. I came for those who are sick, and until we can recognize that that's you and me, then Jesus says, I'm apart from you. I came for those who are in need, not for those who aren't. So what, what does the, the teaching of the church say? If we look back through the, some of the historic creeds of the church as an example. How has the church talked about mankind? One place we can go back to is uh, at the time of the Reformation, there was something called the Three Forms of Unity. It's the Helvetic Confession, the Belgic Confession, and the Heidelberg Catechism, great documents, uh, written by man, so you've got to take them to the Bible, but good documents. And the Heidelberg Catechism, catechism means question, so a question and answer. Uh, it asks a question in question number eight of the Heidelberg Catechism, and the question is this. It should be catechism, not confession. That's my mistake. But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil? Answer? Yes. Unless we are born again by the Spirit of God, 
The historic confessions of the church would be saying that mankind is so corrupt, they are, look the word, totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil. Is that over the top? The Westminster Confession puts it this way, like another historic document that's helpful as we see what is the church taught. It says this in chapter 6 on sin, from this original corruption, which is original sin, whereby we are utterly indisposed and disabled, we are made opposite to all good, wholly inclined to all evil, and from that original corruption precedes all actual transgressions. To put this in more common language, are you a sinner because you sin, or do you sin because you're a sinner? Do you see the difference? Are you born morally neutral, and therefore you're a sinner because along the way you started to sin, and then you became a sinner, or were you born corrupted? Were you born a sinner, and through your life you simply bear the fruit of being a sinner, and therefore you sin? It's important to know the difference. Because if we are sinners because we sin, why isn't half the population all righteous if we're born just neutral? Why is everybody sin? Because we're born corrupted, we're born in sin. Now, is that what a couple church creeds say? Because whenever you read anything written by man, where do you take it to see if it's true or not? To the Scriptures. You take it to the Scriptures. And when you take this to the Scriptures, Is the Heidelberg Catechism, is the Westminster Confession, are other places hyperbolic, or is it an accurate representation of the teaching of the Bible? Genesis chapter 6, when God is looking upon mankind and giving His evaluation of everyone, here's what He says. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race. He didn't say the wickedness of Johnny and Susie and a few people here and there. The blanket verdict is that the human race is wicked and that every, not just some, this is where the confessions get the language of all, every inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil all the time. And what was the proper response of God to this verdict? It's called the flood. What does mankind deserve? And now, is, is this some kind of, you know, stodgy old, oh, good thing we don't really follow the Old Testament anymore. We don't like that Old Testament. Can we get rid of that? All the Scripture is God-breathed, all of it. The New Testament says the same thing. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3 There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's true of you? Outside of Christ? When you present to this people, do you think they're going to easily accept that? No. How can we begin to explain, how do we begin to understand this ourselves? If we don't understand, I mean, we said, to the extent that you understand this, to the extent that you will look up with unbelievable awe at what God has done. To the extent that you understand this, to the extent that grace truly becomes grace, how do we understand this? How can you explain this to others? One thing the Bible teaches is that every single action, every single thought is obligated to be in obedience to God. Every single one. And Jesus makes it clear, it's not just what we do, it's what we even are motivated to do, as the Sermon on the Mount teaches. 
In Genesis 39, when Joseph is approached by Potiphar's wife, hey, come into me and, you know, let's have this illicit relationship together. Joseph runs away. And as he does so, he says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against Potiphar, my master? That's what you would expect to be there. Because this was the wife of Potiphar, and therefore, if he's going to have an illicit relationship with her, he would be betraying him. And just the same for her. If she is going to betray her husband to have an illicit relationship with Joseph, she should be breaking the vow and the fidelity that she promised to Potiphar. But the Bible says that how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against the Lord? Because every action, every even thought and inclination of the heart is owed in obedience and honor of God. That's why David in Psalm 51, after he commits adultery with Bathsheba and murders Uriah, in his confession, he says, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. How can that be? Unless every action that we commit is owed unto God. That is a frightening prospect. At least it should be. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So that's one way we can understand it, that we understand that every single action that we commit, every single thought that we have, every inclination of our heart is owed in obedience to God. The other thing that can help us understand this and communicate this to others is to recognize the duty that is owed to God in relationship to who He is to us. I want to show you an argument. This, this argument, I think, can help make a lot of sense. It's helped make a lot of sense to me. It comes from a man named Jonathan Edwards, and Jonathan Edwards makes this point. He says, every crime or fault deserves a greater or less punishment in proportion as the crime itself is greater or less. That's common sense. The crime of being despising and casting contempt on another is proportionately more or less heinous as he is under greater or less obligation to honor and obey them. What is he saying? Let's just put it like this. Let's say that you were to go to a family reunion, and at that family reunion, or if you're not a family reunion, you're at home or whatever, uh, you or I, I spit in the face in contempt of my brother. I spit in the face of my brother. And let's just say for, an, for a second there that he didn't deserve that, but I, I did that to him. Is that good or bad? It's bad. Now, let's say that I do the very same thing. I spit in the face in contempt, not of my brother, but of my father. Same action. I spit in the face in contempt of someone. One was my brother, one was my dad. Which one's worse? Dad. Why? Because I owe my father greater honor, duty, and obedience than I do my brother. As the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. So therefore, although it's the same action, it's a worse crime, or it's more heinous to spit in the face of my father than my brother. Let's take it into the civic sphere. This is what Jonathan Edwards is saying. Let's take it into the civic sphere. Let's say you walk out into the street and you spit in the face of a stranger. Now, do you have an, an obligation to show respect to a stranger? Yes, so therefore to spit in his face is something contemptible, and you shouldn't do it, and you would have some sort of repercussion for that. Maybe he'd hit you. But let's say you do the very same thing. You walk into the streets, and rather than spitting in the face of a stranger, you spit, you spit in the face of a police officer. Now, same action, but who is owed more honor, the stranger or the police officer? The police officer, in respect to his position, he has greater authority, and therefore greater honor is stoned the police officer than the stranger. So if I spit in his face, it's worse. Now, let's say I go to court, and I go and I spit in the face of the judge. Now we have someone of higher authority, higher office. Is this getting better or worse for me? 
much worse. And we can keep going higher and higher and higher on human authority. Like, you know, back in the day, if it, when we had kings and queens, if I, if I went into the presence of the king and I went and spit in his face, what would happen to me? They don't ask me what's up. I'm just dead. Do you understand that? Here's what Jonathan Edwards says. He says, God is a being of infinite greatness. Every human being is of finite authority, finite greatness, finite honor, but God is not. God is infinite. He is a being of infinite greatness, infinite majesty, infinite glory, and therefore He is infinitely honorable. As much honor that you would have due to a police officer or a judge or whatever, God is infinite above it, and His authority is infinite and the ground of his right to our obedience is infinitely strong. How bad is this for us now? You thought it was bad to spit in the face of a king? God is infinite above that. And every thought and inclination of your heart is spitting in his face. Therefore, Edwards goes on to say, so that sin against God is a violation of infinite obligation and must be a crime infinitely heinous and so deserving of infinite punishment. Now imagine every thought and inclination of your heart is spitting in his face. How's it going for you? The better we understand this, the better we understand the radical love of God, that he could love you because you are not lovable. Romans 2 says it this way, don't you know that you're storing up wrath against yourself? If every action that you commit is an affront to God because you are not searching after Him, everything is wholly inclined to all evil, every inclination of your heart is against Him, everything which you are infinitely obligated to honor Him and infinitely obligated to obey Him, think about it like this, when God tells the stars where to go, the stars bow in obedience to God and say yes. When God says for you to do something, you spit in his face and say no. You're storing up wrath for yourself. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, what's called in the Old Testament the day of the Lord. The Israelites in the Old Testament saying, oh, let the day of the Lord come, let the day of the Lord come, because they thought when the, when the Lord comes, when the day of the Lord comes, God's going to destroy Israel's enemies and Israel will be vindicated and we'll be at the top and we'll be the head and no longer the tail. When Joshua comes upon the head of the Lord's armies right on the outside of Jericho, remember this story? And he asked the Lord, the general of the Lord's armies, are you for us or for them? What does he say? Neither. Neither. The question is not, is the Lord for you? The question is, are you for him? And what Amos tells the Israelites is, you want the day of the Lord to come? You think that's going to be a good day for you? Oh, Israelites, you have missed it. It is not going to be a day of light. It will be a day of darkness. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness. It will be as though a man fled from a lion to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite him. To the extent that we get this, we will get grace. How much do you deserve the love of God? Zero. That's not what we're used to hearing. We used to, oh, you know, you're so great, you're so lovely, God saw how lovely you were, and he, he decided to love you because of how lovely you were. Aren't you just so lovely? God loves you. You're so lovely. God. I don't see that in the Bible. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, wholly inclined to all evil, 
every thought and inclination of our heart, spitting in the face of an infinitely honorable God. That's radical love, that he would rescue you. The gospel isn't about you. The gospel is about God and who he is. And God's radical rescue plan is unbelievable. And when we get this, how can we help but not worship him? You must worship God when you understand this. Galatians chapter 1, when the apostle Paul is just white hot for the gospel, he can't even, he just even in the salutation and the opening of the letter, he just gets right to it. He just, he's there. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. He just can't even wait to get to the gospel, to rescue us from the present evil age. It is Jesus who rescues us because we are drowning. And he rescues us in a totally unique way in any other religion, any other system. Jesus is holy and totally unique. Every other supposed savior, and even then it's not really an appropriate word. I mean, if you go to Buddha and you were to say, Buddha, my savior, Buddha would tell you no. Buddha doesn't purport to be anybody's savior. If you went to Muhammad, said, Muhammad, my savior, he'd say, no, I'm not your savior. What Buddha, Muhammad, what every other religious system promises to do for you is to give you a manual to dig yourself out of the hole that you're in. You're swimming and you're drowning, you're drowning, you're reaching up, you're drowning, and every other religion, every other system throws you a manual for how to swim. It says, save yourself. Jesus is unique. Jesus doesn't throw you a manual. Jesus jumps in the water, and he saves you and dies himself while saving you. That's Jesus. That's the gospel. As it says in 1 Peter 2, he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. We have been healed. Only Jesus is the one that can save us from our sins. And the only way that we can be saved is to receive salvation. We bring nothing to the table. Nothing to the table. All we bring to the table is this, our need. That's it. We bring to the table our need, nothing else. John chapter 1 says this, that when you do receive him and believe in his name, when you have faith in what he's done and you rest in his finished work, when he says that it is finished upon the cross and you cling to Jesus, you have the right and now are adopted to become a child of God and you are declared to be righteous. Are you righteous because of what you've done? How much do you deserve of this? What do you bring to the table? You are righteous because of what Jesus has done. It's his righteousness that you're clothed with. And what do we receive as adopted children of God? Romans 5 tells us in the first couple of verses. We receive, as it says, justification. It means we are now right with God because of Christ. We receive peace with God. We no longer have to fear the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is no longer a day of darkness. The day of the Lord is a day of light and that everlasting. We have access to God. He is no longer apart from us, but we now can enter in with confidence to the throne of grace because of the finished work of Christ clung to by faith. We have hope and the hope will never fail us. And that hope lasts into all eternity, and we are reconciled to him as we were separated because of our sin, because we spit in his face at every moment. But Jesus has brought us near, and we are no longer apart from him. That's the gospel. But in order to enter into the fullness of what God has for you, we have to begin by recognizing 
the true meaning of this phrase, while we were yet sinners. Sinners. And when we understand that, to the fullest extent, we understand what true love looks like. We understand what grace truly means. And we understand the beauty, the true beauty of the gospel. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are here today before you in total need and dependence at every moment for the grace of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the full weight of what it means to be a sinner, to help us understand the full merit and deserving that is owed to us because of our sin, that we might praise and worship the Lord Jesus that he on the cross bore the weight of all the wrath that was due to me, was placed on him, that I might today, tomorrow, and for all eternity worship him and live every moment of my life empowered by the Holy Spirit to follow Him and to love Him with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and my neighbor as myself. The beauty of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.